Hey, what are you doing? Oh, absolutely nothing. I'm just waiting for Sonic Colors Ultimate to come out. You know the game's been delayed, right? What? Hey man, you can play this. Hi. That's not <laughs> Perfect. 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 That's our shot right there. No, you didn't misread that title, and I didn't get it wrong, but I'll explain that later. But for those of you who don't know, on September the 7th, we'll be seeing the release of Sonic Colors Ultimate, a remaster of the original Sonic Colors that actually looks pretty good. So I thought... Why not take a look at the original, and see if my thoughts on the game have changed over the years that I've been playing it. God, I remember when this game was announced. I was but a child at the meager age of nine who was just itching to play this game. The characters, the worlds, these weird tiny creatures, everything looked so vibrant and colorful. <laughs> and at this time, I was a huge fan of Sonic Unleashed on the Wii, and so when I learned that the whole game was gonna be nothing but the daytime boost formula from that game, oh boy, let's just say that I was excited. And then the game came out, and I didn't buy it. What, do you think purely loving the lead up to the release of the game would mean that I'd actually buy it on day one? Hell no, I didn't have the money to waste on new and expensive releases. This was at the time where I was on my PSP grind and when my money went towards other games like Uncharted 2. So me buying Sonic Colors on day one was a no-go. Also, against my better judgement, I bought Sonic and the Secret Rings because the cover art looked cooler. But hey, we all have a dark past. Let's just not question why I have three copies of the game. But after enough waiting, I found the game at a decent price at a game store when I was out with my family, and so I bought it. And back then... I really loved this game. There was something about it that I couldn't quite wrap my head around, but it made me truly enjoy playing it. But I will say that even back then I didn't think the story was anything good. I didn't hate it on the level that I do now, but I guess I can appreciate the more simplistic nature that was trying to be achieved here. Although I've always been pro Shonen style Sonic, so do with that information what you will. But with that said, we might as well get the story out of the way. So basically, Eggman, in an attempt to act remorseful for his past actions, has opened up a giant intergalactic amusement park that has other planets bound to it by chains. Sonic thinks this looks suspicious because of course it is, and travels to the park alongside Tails. Whilst journeying, Sonic saves this little alien creature named Yakka and learns through some of the unfunniest Tails translator writing that Eggman has been capturing the wisps from the nearby planets. You know, those ones that were so inconspicuously chained up. As it turns out, the Wisps are a source of Hyper Goon energy that Sonic can... Wait, Hyper Goon? That's the best name they could come up with? Uh, anyways, as it turns out, the Wisps are a source of Hyper Goon energy that Sonic can take advantage of, as seen in the stages. But Eggman wants to transform these Wisps into Nega Wisps and use their energy to fuel his mind control cannon, as seen in one of the lamest exposition scenes in a Sonic game. But I digress. Sonic and Tails learn that these generators are what's holding the planets captive, and so then it becomes Sonic's mission to travel to each planet, defeat the boss, and destroy the generators, freeing said planets. Eventually, the park begins to blow up due to a malfunction with Eggman's machine, and as Sonic and Tails prepare to make their exit, Eggman appears boasting an all-new robot powered by the energy of the Nega Wisps. Sonic then pushes Tails into the cart and gets rid of him, because let's face it, this Tails will be useless here, and Sonic and Eggman duke it out one more time, with Sonic coming out on top. The malfunctioning cannon then creates a black hole that absorbs both Eggman and his amusement park, killing him in the process. Nah, I'm kidding, but after the black hole emerges, the Wisps use their energy to neutralize it and return Sonic to his world before saying goodbye forever. Uh, sort of. What, I don't have a Wii U and I wasn't gonna buy a copy of Lost World on the Wii U just for this video. But if you're wondering, I have it on PC. You probably weren't, but there you go. It is so clear that Sonic Team were trying to aim this game towards a younger audience, and nothing makes it clearer than the simplicity of this plot and the writing. God, the writing. 
some of these cutscenes actually hurt to sit through and the jokes they're just bad and a good chunk of these jokes really overstay their welcome and just go on for way too long it's like they had something but then they just keep rolling with that joke until it becomes unfunny well who am i kidding we both knew how this would end uh, are you talking to the broken robot who can't hear you? Uh, maybe. That's between me and the robot. See, the important thing here is the alien planet is free. Absolutely. So, we can just forget about the whole talking to dead robots thing, right? Nope. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> well, come on. I've seen you save the day a lot of times, but I've never seen you talk to a pile of metal. Touché. I now often find myself just skipping through the cutscenes just to get back to the actual gameplay and have some fun. I mean, I know I'm not the target audience for this writing, but come on, I've seen games and shows that are aimed towards the same audience that are leagues better in terms of the quality of their writing. Now, I'm not going to talk about Sonic and Tails because, well, I already have, so go click on those videos if you want to. But Eggman here is once again the main antagonist, and at this point, I don't consider him a major threat anymore. He's definitely leaned a lot more into that comedic style of his character that had been breaking out from time to time, and while I don't think that's a bad take on his character, especially when you have the lovable Mike Pollock as the voice actor, I would love to once again see a more serious take on Eggman, you know, similar to Adventure 2, not really 06. Although I will say that the style of Eggman works incredibly well in Sonic Boom, but that's a story for another time. Other than that, you have characters like Orbot and Cubot here who exist purely as a form of comic relief, and I use that term very loosely. Although I will proudly admit that Cubot did have a good line. When you consider what we're doing from a robot's point of view, it's actually pretty gruesome. Don't think about it. And I do also get a little kick out of the Eggman PA announcements that played throughout the game. But that's pretty much it. It doesn't help that this game is devoid of any other characters outside of Sonic, Tails, Eggman, Cuba, Orbot, and Yakka. Apparently, you're here before the park has fully opened, but then in the DS game, the park is inhabited by several other characters from the Sonic universe, so... Yeah. Oh, also there's a DS port of the game. More on that later. Look, I don't really have a problem with the Sonic story taking a simpler route, as long as it can still tell an engaging story with some decent characters. Look at Heroes, for example. Whilst characters like Tails weren't really at their best there, other characters like those in Team Dark were great, especially with their interactions. And honestly, I think the lighthearted tone and colours was received so well because it was like a breath of fresh air. The Sonic team saw that there were people who didn't enjoy the darker stories from previous games, and so they remedied that with this lighthearted tone. The biggest problem is that it led to these stories. But how does the game itself fare? Like I said, it's purely daytime boost style stages from Unleashed, so it should be great, right? Well, kinda. The game is broken up into six worlds, each with six acts and a boss battle. Plus, there's a seventh final area that has two acts and houses the final boss. So you're thinking, holy shit, that's a lot of levels. And it is, but each act is incredibly short, like in the one to two minute region. Sometimes shorter and rarely longer. And the stages that do take a bit longer tend to have an auto-scrolling gimmick, or it usually has some of the most basic stop-and-go platforming that there is. But I'll say more on that later. Just quickly before we move into the game, I do want to say that for the sake of this video looking its best, I am using an emulator here to play Sonic Colors. I'm not condoning the use of emulation, but I think that I can get away with it because I do own a Wii and Sonic Colors. Hell, I have two Wiis, one's in black and the other's in white. Now I just need a brown Wii to even it all out. I'm also using a couple of mods, those being the Generations HD Textures mod and the PS4 HUD mod because I used a PS4 controller to play this game. But with all that said, let's actually get going with the game. The first stage is Tropical Resort, and you're actually thrown into the first two acts without any cutscenes or story whatsoever, which did catch me off guard the first time I played this. And I remember one of the first things I did with this game. I just stood still, taking the environment and the music in. If there's one thing that Colors absolutely nails, it's that sense of wonder and excitement, always impressing me with its sheer sense of scale and beauty at times. And it's running on the goddamn Wii! And this soundtrack helps aid in this feeling too. It is so good. While I personally prefer other Sonic soundtracks, I cannot deny how brilliant this one is. And it isn't like other games where it reuses the stage music for each act. 
The first act has what is essentially the main theme for the world, but then each subsequent act has that theme remixed in some fashion, giving it a slightly different feel, but not so different as to take you out of the experience or make you feel like you're somewhere else entirely. Even the goddamn menu music is kick-ass. Genuinely, go and give this soundtrack a listen if you haven't. But anyways, this first act is great. It's a really fun and nice introduction that lets you comfortably grasp Sonic's controls in the game. For example, with this winding trail of rings that teaches you that Sonic can magnetize rings that are close by whilst boosting, or these balloons that let you practice the homing attack. And speaking of controls, they're fine enough, but honestly it can be a bit off at times. You have all of Sonic's moves unlocked from the start, like the Quick Step and Drift, but this time you can only use the Quick Step and Drift during specific segments when an icon appears at the bottom of the screen. Now I think it's pretty obvious why this was done, that being the Wii Remote. The Wii Remote has a very limited amount of buttons that can be used, so they had to relegate specific moves to specific sections of the game in order to combat this issue. This is why the drifting and quick step segments are often just used as transitions. Although I will go ahead and praise Sonic Colors for giving you four different methods of control so you can decide which one suits you and it makes it most accessible. But I think if they just focus on the Wii Remote and Nunchuck combination alongside the GameCube controller, then these transition specific abilities could just become normal abilities that could be used any time. This perhaps could have allowed for better level design overall with the 3D sections having a greater presence. Sonic can also perform the stomp and wall jump, which is nice, but am I the only one who misses the triangle jump from Heroes and running along the walls in Shadow the Hedgehog? Please, Sega, bring that back. You bought the wall running back in Lost World, and honestly, that was probably the most fun I had in that game, so clearly, there is something there. No, I will not buy a physical copy of this game. But yeah, to go back to what I was saying before, Sonic's controls are serviceable, but can feel a bit stiff, especially when platforming on the smaller blocks in some of the later levels. He does feel quite heavy at times, which can make platforming unnecessarily trickier. To counter this, Sonic has a double jump, which does help with correcting your movements and does make platforming a tad bit easier, but I would have just preferred that they fine-tuned Sonic's control so that this was never an issue in the first place. I could really see this working well with more of an adventure control scheme, if anything. In this stage, you're first introduced to the Wisps, and each one acts as a different power-up for Sonic. You have the White Wisp, which Sonic can collect to fill up his boost gauge, and the Cyan Wisp, which lets Sonic travel in laser form that can be used to find shortcuts or collectibles, and I'll talk about the others as we come across them. You will notice, though, that there are many areas in these stages that look like a Wisp capsule should be there, but it seems to be missing. This is because the idea is to return to these stages later when you have all the Wisp powers unlocked. I guess this was their way of combating the short game length, but I will say that replaying the levels when you have access to all the Wisp powers is usually when they're the most fun. You have the most routes open, ways to diversify the gameplay, and the levels naturally become more explorable, with multiple ways of being able to get to the goal. Usually. But sometimes, you get those levels that don't really have this, and in those cases, it barely makes a difference. As well as this, the Wisps can allow you to finish stages faster, so in a strange way, utilizing the Wisp powers properly makes already short stages that much shorter, making this level length issue all the more glaring. I would have preferred it if each world was condensed down into two or three longer and more developed acts, just to keep the pace of the game a bit more fluid, and to let each stage sink in and not end after one and a half minutes. I mean, there's a stage at one point where you can do nothing but quick step and it can be finished in less than 30 seconds. Hell, the fourth act of Tropical Resort can be finished in 20 seconds. This is the exact same issue that I have with the levels in Sonic Forces, and don't you worry, we'll get to that game, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. But overall, Tropical Resort is fast and fun. You're not really stopped too often in your tracks, and even the 2D sections are pretty good. I do really like the first few acts here. Now let's move on to the next act, and what the hell? Look, ladies and gentlemen, meet some of the slowest moving platforms in history that are Switch controlled. Why is this here? This game was doing so well and then it falls this flat on its face? Explain yourself. So yeah, it's clear that the 2D platforming is definitely slower and a lot more blocky in its nature compared to previous games. And the platforming can be pretty hit or miss. Most of the time it's fine and can be fun to traverse, but there are times where you're stripped of any speed or cohesive level design in favor of these bog standard blocks for platforms. I don't entirely hate it, but I wouldn't have associated this with modern Sonic. With all that said, yes, I do think that Sonic Unleashed has the better boost stages. 
They are well designed and rely less on the blocky platforming nature that is consistent with this game, but that's just my opinion. As well as this, I also prefer the boost stages and generations. They feel a lot more fleshed out and developed, and just overall more well designed compared to the stages and colours. Plus, in both Unleashed and Generations, there isn't as much of a reliance on 2D platforming with modern Sonic, not that I'm against it. But there we have another point, and we're going to refer back to my title with this one. As much as this game is advertised as a 3D Sonic game, it is predominantly 2D, with some 3D here and there. There are some stages that do the 3D stuff right, you know, giving you full control in a 3D environment just as you got in Unleashed, but a good chunk of the time, the 3D sections take control away from the player, leaving you with only the ability to sidestep or to drift into another 2D section, essentially making the 3D of the game nothing more than a transition sequence. Look, I like modern Sonic in 2D enough, but give me a choice between that and 3D, and I will always go for 3D. That's just my preference. I mean, Sonic Heroes is my favorite game of all time, and that doesn't have any 2D sections in it, so... yeah. I just don't understand why they don't do more 3D with modern Sonic. The way he controls, I feel anyways, is more suited to the 3D gameplay. But now we have the boss of Tropical Resort, and it is just so easy. It's barely a threat and becomes such a joke when you harness the wisp powers properly. And I thought it was just because it's the first boss, but no, pretty much every single boss in this game is very easy. But what I do like is that after you complete Tropical Resort, both Sweet Mountain and Starlight Carnival open, allowing you to choose which area you go to first. For the sake of this video, we're heading to Sweet Mountain. And the entire theme of this level is food. Yeah, that about sums it up. Again, starts off with some good acts and then devolves into basic Mario Maker levels as you go through. Seriously, who thought this was fun? I'm literally having to stop and press buttons to make this elevator go up. I can finish Sonic Forces a few more times before this is done. Okay, that's kinda harsh, but do you see my point? This just drags out the level for no good reason. And you wanna know the funny part? This act still takes less than two minutes to beat. And even worse than that, is that this kind of level design is all over the place. And not just in this world. I think that pretty much all the stages from here on out are littered with this sort of shit and it just pisses me off to no end. In this world, you're introduced to the orange rocket wisp that blasts you high into the air and lets you freefall for a bit, and the yellow drill wisp that lets you dig into the ground and travel through water. I don't have much to say about the Rocket Wisp, but the Drill Wisp has one major flaw that I think prevents it from being so much better. Although don't get me wrong, it is pretty fun to drill around as the Wisp. But the problem that I have is that when you so much as inhale a single particle of oxygen, Sonic transforms back out of the Wisp state with no way for you to transform back, meaning that you have to go and find another Drill Wisp capsule, even if you had plenty of time left with the power up in the first place. At this point, it's just a nitpick, but imagine how awesome it would be if you could activate and deactivate the wisps at will. You could drill for a bit, then surface to collect items or defeat enemies, and then while you're still midair, transform back so you can go underground. Imagine how cool it would be to pull off ridiculously long combo chains with this feature. And it would have also paved the way for some really interesting level design that could have played off of this. And I think that this feature could also be beneficial, because there are times when Sonic automatically transforms out of the wisp state to keep things going, but other times where you're stuck, waiting for the meter to run out as you flop around like a dying fish. So it could help with the pacing of some stages. Other than that, this world is... fun enough? Not much more to say than that. Um, the boss is pretty easy, but you already knew that. Uh... Starlight Carnival is up next and... Holy shit, this looks incredible! This could easily pass for a PS3 or 360 title and I would not have questioned it in the slightest. Oh man, I can't wait to run around in this giant open fleet of ships exploring every inch of this vast what and we're inside for most of the time. Seriously? No, no. Seriously? You have all this brilliance for a level up here, all this potential ready to be actualized, and you stick us inside for most of the time. This is easily the best looking stage in the game and pretty much the only times we're up here is for auto running segments and quick step segments. Again, amazing ideas with some cool moments, but these are bogged down with the very basic level design. Tell me that these sections don't remind you of something with the scale of Egg Fleet or Final Fortress. Imagine how awesome it would have been to have had very open level design here wherein you could travel between ships, and then there could be loads of different ways to complete the stage like an Egg Fleet, but... No. Nothing. 
I seriously only think that these slow 2D sections are here to pad out the stages to make them feel longer. Notice how these don't really appear too much in the earlier acts, but are definitely more numerous in the later acts. That's actually a trend you'll kind of notice with all these worlds. The first few acts here are almost always great, you know, high focus on 3D, solid level design, the works. But then as you move through the acts, they tend to become more basic with an emphasis on gimmicky platforming more than anything else. I'm not saying that this blocky platforming is bad, but this is more the type of platforming that I would associate with Mario and not Sonic. Fuck it, let's just talk about the wisps. The first wisp is the blue cube wisp which slows the game down to a screeching halt to force you to do some of the most simple puzzle platforming that there is. I hate this wisp power up. It's not fun, it stops you constantly, and is used as an excuse to put out some of the most boring level design yet. Seriously, this is the type of thing I expect to see from Balan Wonderworld, not Sonic. This doesn't feel like a power up, but instead a forced gimmick. It's not optional in most cases, and it doesn't feel like a bonus to Sonic's arsenal of moves. I give this wisp a 10 out of 10 on the who gives a crap scale. Next, there's a green hover wisp which allows you to hover and perform the light speed dash. I can't say too much more, but it's pretty fun to use in most cases, so there's that. The boss here though is the best one so far. First off, it's fully 3D, or well, it tried at least. And secondly, it takes some kind of effort to beat here. That doesn't mean it's difficult, but at this point it doesn't really matter. Also, I really do like the boss theme here. Next up, we have Planet Wisp. This stage has an interesting aesthetic as this world is still in the process of being converted by Eggman, so it's halfway between the lush, vibrant homeworld of the Wisps and a mechanical factory setting. Now, a lot of these earlier parts are usually great fun and have a good amount of 3D. I really do like the first act here, it's genuinely quite good. And thank god as you get further on it continues with the same quality of- oh god damn it. Why does this game keep doing this? Why do the developers have such a hard on for 2D gameplay? I understand that making 3D games is more difficult, but there's barely any 3D in this game. I know I'm beating a dead horse here, but this issue is way too prevalent. Awesome idea that starts off great, but then becomes a- what the fuck? It's this world where I noticed the most problems with precise platforming with Sonic, especially in certain sections where there are these tiny platforms that are so difficult to land on and usually have a death pit below them, and they can be numerous here. The wisp here is the pink spike wisp that allows you to cling to surfaces and perform the spin dash. Now, this is my favourite wisp in the game purely because it feels most like a power-up. There's no gimmicks or special places to use it, it just gives Sonic some new moves without breaking the pace of the stage, although it is only used in 2D which kinda sucks. Just load up the boss footage from here. Now this boss is... what? Hang on, this is the same boss as Tropical Resort. I said to get the footage from the Planet Wisp boss. What do you mean this is the boss? It's the same thing. You're telling me that they just reused this boss? Well at least they didn't reuse the other two son of a bitch. Yes, from here on out, the boss battles are just repeated from earlier. There are some minor changes, but at this point, it's just lazy above anything else. If Sonic 1 can have every boss be unique in some way, then there is no excuse here. Look, when they reused the third boss fight, they didn't even change the strip from Starlight Road. Again, lazy. Next up is Aquarium Park, and this is the level where I'm most conflicted. I'm a sucker for levels with an oriental theme, it's one of the reasons why Chunan is my favourite level in Sonic Unleashed. So I wanted so badly to love this level, but it's a water level. And if you don't know, me and water levels in Sonic have a pretty hit or miss relationship. And the water sections here, I'll be honest, aren't that great. Nowhere near the hell of something like Labyrinth Zone, but with the way that they're designed, coupled with how Sonic controls underwater, it does leave a lot to be desired. Let me explain. When underwater, Sonic can infinitely jump, which is already raising some red flags, but as well as that, you fall with the grace of a feather, which is so jarring considering how heavy Sonic can feel when not in water. And for some reason, you get an air dash, but only one? It makes no sense why you can jump infinitely, but dash a grand total of once. So getting around in these sections can be tedious. The fastest way to move is by using the Drill Wisp, and when you don't have it, travelling in these water sections can feel slow and monotonous. Plus, with the way that these water levels are designed, it definitely favours the use of the Drill Wisp above anything else. And this sucks so much, cause when you're not in the water, the levels are great. Especially the first few. Yeah, there's that slow platforming here and there, and the Blue Wisp rears its ugly head in, but it's pretty good. 
Except for the act with the fucking yellow spring, I swear to god. Why is it that every time I start to compliment this game, I end up criticizing it? I swear I like this game. Oh, thank god, we're off that spring and we can get back to some good old fashioned platforming fun- Oh, for fuck's sake. Next, we have Asteroid Coaster, home to many asteroids and... coasters. Well, at least they're forward about it. Again, aesthetics, great. Music, great. Early level design, great. But then the amazing 2D platforming returns again. This level could have been incredible in 3D. You know, jumping from asteroid to asteroid in a big open level with roller coasters that could be used as optional transport. But it's just lost potential. I mean, that is what happens from time to time, but it could have been fleshed out a lot more. There's even a whole act here where all you do is run around in a circle until you push one button. I am not even kidding, that's the entire level. How did this even make it into the game? I also just want to take the time to talk about the abundance of invisible walls all over the place. In most cases it's fine and not particularly intrusive, but there are places where there just shouldn't be any. It prevents you from going backwards so if you miss that collectible that you wanted, too bad, suck it up, or restart the level. I miss when Sonic games didn't have these invisible walls all over the place because it allowed you to, essentially, create your own shortcuts. Take Sonic Adventure 2 for example with Sonic's last stage. There's this long grinding section that can take some time to go down, but you could just jump down the building and with some careful movement, land directly on the rail at the bottom. I just miss being able to pull off stunts like this. Also, has anyone noticed how many assets are reused in these 2D sections? Take the laser gates for example, all these rotating platforms with the switches. It definitely becomes a lot more glaring as you progress through the game. The wisp in this world is the purple frenzy wisp, which is basically just the wisp that Eggman has created. It transforms you into a creature that consumes everything you touch, growing larger and slower in the process. It's pretty fun and non-intrusive in 2D, but holy crap, controlling this thing in 3D is a no-go. There is no control. But luckily, there's only a couple of instances where this is the case, so I can mostly forgive it. Now we unlock the final area, known as Terminal Velocity. There's two acts here, the first being an auto-running quickstep level where you escape from Eggman's mechs that are hunting you down, and the second which is an auto-running quickstep level that can be beaten in less than 30 seconds. <sighs> now, I don't really like these levels, but I don't quite hate them either. This isn't one of the major worlds that's meant to have long gameplay sections, so... I can kind of forgive it. Plus, with how short these levels are, they do emphasize the speed and urgency of the current situation, so it's fine in that case. Although I don't think it would have been too much to ask for some normal 3D controls. Also, why is it that we can jump now when escaping this mech but couldn't before in the previous acts? It's just a nitpick at this point, but it's just inconsistent. Ah well, these are just the lead up to the final boss of the game, and if you remember my thoughts on the bosses so far, then you will be... Surprised to hear that this boss is fucking awesome. Holy shit, I'm not kidding. This is an incredibly climactic fight. Yeah, sure, it's easy, but holy crap, this fight gives you the chills. The boss theme is brilliant, with it being an orchestral take on the main theme of the game, and it truly works wonders. It even syncs up to your actions, and then all the wisps start joining you by your side as you deal damage to Eggman, and then you go in for one final attack with all the wisps surrounding you, and just... Wow. You know how you start getting giddy as the epic music ramps up and kicks in and then you get that little shiver down your spine? That's what this fight does to you. This is proof that a boss fight doesn't have to be difficult to be good. Now, this boss fight still does have its minor issues. Like I said, it's still pretty easy and the attacks could have been a little more interesting. It's cool that it uses wisp powers against you, but from what I've seen, it only uses frenzy spikes, laser and cube. I think some attacks could have been added to take advantage of the other wisps, like maybe with the Drill Wisp, he could use some kind of corkscrew attack similar to the Sky Babylon boss fight from Sonic Rush Adventure. And maybe the Rocket Wisp could blast you high into the sky and then you would have to use the homing attack on a bunch of obstacles to reach the boss. And Hover, yeah I don't really know what you do with Hover, but something. Maybe some kind of anti-gravity gimmick? Also this fight is once again quick step only, which is, eh, okay I guess, but mercifully it's fully 3D. And I know what some of you are thinking, if this is the final boss, where's Supersonic? Well, the answer to that is back in the levels as you may have seen these red rings scattered all over the place. As you collect them, you unlock these extra levels called Eggman Sonic Simulator. Be all of them and you get Supersonic unlocked and he's now finally playable in regular stages and 
thank god, because I missed playing as him. Although you can't use any color powers whilst transformed, but who cares, I'm supersonic, fuck yeah, let's go. And that's about it. That was Sonic Colors. Now, it may seem as though I hate this game, but in actuality, I quite like it. I may not think of it as highly as I once did, but it's still a damn fine Sonic game. I'm not the biggest fan of the 2D stuff, but I can get some enjoyment out of them. But there are times when the design of these areas is just too bland and too basic, making it a chore to go through. I almost always have a blast with the 3D sections, and those, for me anyways, were the highlights of the game. I just wish the 3D had a higher focus, and like I said, with levels like Starlight Carnival, there was just so many missed opportunities with the level design, especially when they trap you indoors for an extended period of time. But god damn, do I love the look and feel of this game. The level themes are so original, and it just fills you with that want to explore and run around. It ain't like Forces where it just reuses old levels all the damn time, and for that, I can applaud it. The wisps here for the most part are fun to use, but I do have my qualms, mainly with the cube wisp. But otherwise, they were pretty well implemented and optional a lot of the time. The story and characters aren't something I can get behind, but this sort of tone in a Sonic game can work well. Maybe if there were better writers here who didn't keep delivering such iconic lines as Baldy Nose Hair, we could have got something great. I don't know, it may sound like a cop out for me to say that I do like this game, but that's the honest truth. There's a lot of good here and hey, Sonic Generations refined what was here further to give some of the best modern Sonic level design yet. And with all of this said, my final rating for this game is a 7 out of 10. I was thinking of giving it a 6.5, but I don't know, that feels too low. But I also feel like scores above 7 may be too high. Although I can see why people would go to either end of the spectrum. Alright, now that that's finally done, we can talk about the DS version. Basically... I'm gonna reach for the 